Welcome to Crime, Corruption, and Cocktails, the true crime podcast where we look at cases of corruption and negligence and examine their historical and cultural implications. Today, I'm drinking an Aperol Spritz. What do you have, Del? I am drinking a Twisted Tea, and on this week's Mini Soul, we're going to be looking at celebrity murderers. There is a surprisingly high number of famous individuals who have committed heinous crimes, including rape and murder. We're going to be looking at three cases in this mini-sode. The first person we're going to look at is Don King. Don King is a boxing manager and promoter who became a household name through the promotion of well-known boxers and their fights, including Muhammad Ali, Mike Tyson, George Foreman, Joe Frazier, and Evander Holyfield. Before boxing promotion, King ran an illegal bookmaking operation out of the basement of a record store on Kingsman Road and was charged with killing two men in separate incidents. The first was determined to be a justifiable homicide after it was found that King shot Hillary Brown in the back and killed them while he was attempting to rob one of King's gambling houses in 1954. In 1967, King was convicted of second-degree murder for the second killing after he was found guilty of stomping to death one of his employees, Sam Garrett, who owed him $600. King was released in 1972 and received a pardon in 1983 by Ohio Governor Jim Rhodes with letters from Jesse Jackson, Coretta Scott King, George Venovich, Art Medell and Gay Paul, among others, being written in support of Don King. The next person is Michael Jace. Jace worked as an actor with credits on Law and Order, Cold Case, and a main cast role on The Shield. From 2009 to 2013, he had a small recurring role on the television series Southland. Jace was arrested by the Los Angeles Police Department on the evening of May 19, 2014 at his Hyde Park, South Los Angeles home following a domestic violence report as well as Jace's own 911 call in which he stated, quote, I shot my wife, end quote. When police arrived, they found Jace's wife, April, dead from gunshot wounds. After being questioned by police regarding his wife's death, Chase confessed to the shooting. On May 31st, 2016, Jace was found guilty of second-degree murder. Notably, the LAPD was able to crack the password-protected security on April's iPhone 5C. On June 10, 2016, Jace was sentenced to 40 years to life in prison. Oscar Petorius was a professional sprinter who, despite having both of his feet amputated, was able to achieve a high level of success in athletics. In the early morning of Thursday, February 14, 2013, Petraeus shot and killed Riva Stenkamp at his home in Pretoria. Petorius admitted that he shot Stenkamp four times, causing her death, but claimed he mistook her for a possible intruder. His murder trial began on March 3rd, 2014 in Pretoria High Court. On May 20th, 2014, the trial proceedings were adjourned until June 30th to enable Pretoria to undergo psychiatric evaluation to establish whether he could be held criminally responsible for shooting Stenkamp. On June 30th, 2014, the trial resumed after the evaluation report said Pistorius could be held criminally responsible. The state prosecutor was quoted as saying, quote, Mr. Pistorius did not suffer from a mental illness or defect that would have rendered him not criminally responsible for the offense charged, end quote. The defense closed its case on July 8th and closing arguments were heard on August 7th and 8th. On September 12th, Pistorius was found guilty of culpable homicide and one firearm-related charge of reckless endangerment related to discharging a firearm in a restaurant. He was found not guilty of two other firearm-related charges relating to possession of illegal ammunition and firing a firearm through the sunroof of a car. 
On October 21st, 2014, he received a prison sentence of a maximum of five years for culpable homicide and a concurrent three-year suspended prison sentence for the separate reckless endangerment conviction. On July 21st, 2016, the National Prosecuting Authority, the NPA, confirmed that it would appeal against Judge Masipa's quote-unquote, shockingly lenient six-year jail sentence. The NPA was then given 21 days to take its appeal bid to the Supreme Court of Appeal, the SCA. On November 24, 2017, the SCA increased Pistorius's jail sentence to 13 years and five months. Prosecutors had argued that the six-year term was too short. The SCA ruled his sentence be increased to 15 years less time already served. Pistorius would not be eligible for parole until at least 2023. The final celebrity murderer we'll look at is Aaron Hernandez. Hernandez was a professional footballer who primarily played for the New England Patriots. Hernandez had a number of run-ins with the law throughout his life, beginning just a few months after he arrived in Florida as a pre-freshman. By his own admission, Hernandez became jumpy in nightclubs and had a history of taking offense at minor slights. He also said that he believed people were trying to physically challenge him and were looking to fight him. Acquaintances described Hernandez as a follower who put himself in jeopardy by hanging out with a dangerous crowd. As a patriot, Hernandez hired two of his friends from Bristol, both of whom had criminal records as assistants. One of them, Alexander S. Bradley, was his drug dealer. As Hernandez's assistant, Bradley's other duties included calming Hernandez down during fits of rage and paranoia and obtaining weapons for him. After his death, his high school classmate and lover said that being drafted by the Patriots was, quote, the worst thing the NFL could have done, end quote, because it put him back into close proximity to the criminal friends he had in Connecticut. Hernandez had a second apartment that was kept a secret from his fiance Shayana Jenkins. It was used to store drugs and weapons. He would often go there to chain smoke marijuana. In 2012, Hernandez told his agent that he got his respect through weapons. Boston police officials once questioned Hernandez outside of a local bar, but the circumstances around the interview are unclear. While in prison, he told a fellow prisoner that he was a member of the Bloods. Hernandez was investigated in connection with a double homicide that took place on July 16, 2012, near the Cure Lounge in Boston's South End. Daniel Jorge Correra de Abreu, 29, and Safiro Texera Furtado, 28, both immigrants from Cape Verde and living in Dorchester, were killed by gunshots fired into their vehicle. Witnesses testified that Hernandez's silver SUV pulled up next to the victims and someone from his car yelled racial epitaphs towards the victims. Someone from the car then fired five shots, killing the two immigrants. Police immediately identified Hernandez, who was then playing for the Patriots and the club's security camera footage. On June 18, 2013, police searched Hernandez's home in connection with an investigation into the shooting death of a friend, Odin Lloyd, whose body was found with multiple gunshot wounds to the back and chest in an industrial park about a mile from Hernandez's home. On June 26, 2013, Hernandez was charged with first-degree murder in addition to five gun-related charges. The Patriots released Hernandez from the team about 90 minutes later, before being officially informed of the charges against him. Two other men were also arrested in connection with Lloyd's death. On August 22, 2013, Hernandez was indicted by a grand jury for the murder of Lloyd. He pled not guilty on September 6, 2013. On April 15, 2015, he was found guilty of murder in the first degree, a charge that in Massachusetts, automatically carries a sentence of life in prison without any possibility of parole. He was also found guilty on five firearms charges. A motive for the murder was never definitively established. Police investigated the possibility that Lloyd may have learned of Hernandez's bisexuality and that Hernandez was worried that Lloyd might out him to others. On May 15, 2014, Hernandez was indicted on murder charges for the killings of Diabrero and Furtado. 
with additional charges of armed assault and attempted murder associated with shots fired at the surviving occupants in the vehicle. On April 14, 2017, Hernandez was acquitted of the murders and most of the other charges were found guilty of illegal possession of a handgun. On April 19, 2017, at 3.05 a.m., five days after Hernandez was acquitted of the 2012 Boston double homicides, correction officers found Hernandez hanging from bed sheets from the window in his cell at the Correctional Center in Lancaster, Massachusetts. He was transported to UMass Memorial Hospital in Leominster, where he was pronounced dead at 4.07 a.m. Jenny, what are your thoughts on these four cases of celebrity murderers? They're all very wild, very interesting. And I think for people that are a little more familiar with them, you can definitely see where some of the celebrity privilege, I would say, comes in. I think that was the case for Oscar Pistorius to an extent. I also think it was probably the case for Don King. I don't know all of the details of Sam Garrett's death, the man he stomped to death, but it's pretty disgusting to me that so many people would try and ask for a pardon for someone that has killed two people. Like I said, I don't know all of the details, but I mean, it sounds like, I mean, there's no reason to stomp somebody to death. That's pretty a pretty horrific way to kill someone and to die. And then, I don't know, for someone like Coretta Scott King to stand up for him essentially does not sit right with me. The Michael Jace story I have not heard about, but I mean, I think, you know, everybody has seen some law and order to an extent. So there's definitely some irony there with that one, someone working on law and order. And I don't know if The Shield was also like a cop crime show. I never watched that. But again, kind of bizarre. I think we might have talked about Oscar Pistorius before, but there are a lot of questions in that case. I know a lot went into the trial of trying to prove whether he really did think that Riva was an intruder or not. And at this moment, I don't know where I stand. If I looked into it a little more, maybe I would have different thoughts. But it's sad that someone had to die like that. And, you know, if he did accidentally kill her, that's awful too and a lot he has to deal with. But I'm glad you picked Aaron Hernandez for the last one because I think that is really fascinating. And another story of this privilege because. I do believe that the Patriots kind of covered up some of what he did. And at the very least, he had the public behind him supporting his innocence because he was part of the New England Patriots. So people like very blindly supporting him, I think, until more information came out. I don't think people were as supportive. But I know we talked about CTE recently in the Chris Benoit case, and it Definitely sounds like Aaron Hernandez had some. I know there's a documentary on Netflix that goes more in depth with that. And I think it was proven that he had CTE within, you know, like a analysis of his brain after his death. But that paranoia and that rage, I think maybe he, I don't know if he always had this kind of short temper, but his time playing football in college and high school and in the NFL professionally definitely made it worse. And I think he did have a little level of entitlement too. I mean, if he's saying like weapons give me power, there's something weird about that too. You'd think being a professional football player with lots of money would give you power, but no, having to have some kind of like violent leg up on someone is what gives you power. It's, it's interesting. What are your thoughts though? Yeah, I think I definitely agree with you. And I think it's also a situation where, It shows that money and fame does not change who you are as a person in terms of what you are capable of doing or not doing. I think that a lot of times people look at celebrities and they say, well, you have this perfect life. You know, nothing can go wrong with it. But I think time and time again, as we look at these cases of both celebrities being the murderers and the times that we've talked about celebrities being the victims. No one is safe from the negative things that can happen in someone's life. I think that 
Don King is definitely one of those examples of like, you are only out of jail because of who you are and the connections that you have. Because, okay, for the first one, you can kind of see it like, okay, that person was stealing from you, but you still shot the person in the back. So I'm not sure how they got that to be justified if you're shooting someone in the back as they're running away. But definitely with the second one, where he stomped someone to death. Like, how can you just, you know, let someone out? And not just let them out, but actually have them receive a pardon, which uh, was probably given to him so that he would be able to legally promote boxing as a part of the requirements to get that license. And yeah, like you see Coretta Scott King and you're just like, what? This it's like a mismatch in a way, like seeing her name on the list of individuals that was supporting someone, um, especially given her history and who she was married to. When it comes to Michael Jace, I think that his is a case that we unfortunately see very often, and that is a domestic violence situation where it ends with murder of one of the individuals. And, you know, if you look at the stats, it's most likely to be the woman or, you know, wife in this case. I do think it's interesting that, you know, he called the police and that it seems like he was trying to show remorse. Um, I do wish there was more information, but I am happy that he was sentenced and I definitely don't see him being able to get out of prison early. Uh, When it comes to Oscar, I'm definitely (laughs) with you where I don't really know where I stand with that case. I can definitely see it being the way he described, where he just mistaken for an, an intruder. We have seen this before where, you know, someone gets accidentally shot because they didn't know that person was coming home at the time or they were behind the door. For me, this case speaks more to limiting gun access because if there wasn't a gun available, then this would have never happened. And finally, when it comes to Aaron Hernandez, I think that his case just speaks to how having money and power tend to multiply any of the negative aspects that you have going on. And I think that his struggles with his sexuality and his fears that he was going to be exposed and the unfortunate negative consequences that could have came with that exposure definitely led him to do things that he otherwise likely wouldn't have done. And CTE was likely a factor in that. But like I said, in the Chris Benoit case, it definitely doesn't eliminate a person's culpability for the crimes that they commit against another individual. Absolutely. That wraps up this week's case. Thank you for listening. Let us know in the comments what you think about the cases we looked at this week. You can read more about this case and how to support us in the links below. We will be back next week with a brand new episode. As always, stay safe.